Today, we're going to catch our breath and take a brief break from the story. We're going to review what we've covered so far in our jog through the Bible. Thanks for tuning in to The Bible Brief. Now, you may be saying to yourself, I forgot this was a jog through. It feels like we're just crawling through the Bible. After all, we've just made it through the book of Genesis, and that took us eight episodes. There are still 65 books to cover. Well, let me get rid of your fears. Genesis will be the slowest book for us, and we're not going to spend nearly the same amount of time in any of the other books. As you look at the Bible, you should always think of Genesis, and to a large extent the first five books of the Bible, as the foundation on which everything else is built. The better you know these books, the more the rest of the Bible will make sense to you. We spent so much time on Genesis because we find the basis for the rest of the story of the Bible in it. If I can continue building the analogy, the best foundations are those that are both wide and deep. So as you continue to learn the Bible, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to continue to revisit the first five books of the Bible to make that foundation as strong as possible. Now, if you remember from one of the first episodes of this podcast, we discussed that the Bible is special because it's in the Bible that we learn about God as he has expressed himself. It's by his authorship through the work of human writers that we can know more about God. As much as we want to build Bible literacy and knowledge, the greatest proof of understanding is coming to know God himself. Not just to know about God, but to know God personally. That's why we want to help people learn the Bible. Because the Bible is the place where we can come to know God as he has revealed himself in writing. And that's why the Bible Literacy Foundation exists. To help people understand the life-changing story and message of the Bible. The life-changing message of the Bible is this. That we can know God. That we can be made new by him. And we will get into this more and more in this jog through as we see the story of the Bible culminate in Jesus. God, not in word only, but in flesh dwelling among humanity. As we continue in the story, will you consider partnering with us as we make Bible learning content for you? We're currently developing an app, and success in that endeavor will largely depend upon three things. Faithful and appealing Bible content, functional defined app and interface, and marketing so that people can know that the app exists once it launches. Becoming a monthly donor can help us as we seek to build out the app content hire talented graphic and motion designers, and market an app that can help people learn the Bible like they never have before. In addition to that, you can help support this podcast. If the Bible Brief has helped you learn the Bible, will you partner with us? Consider donating today at BibleLiteracyFoundation.com. Help others come to know the life-changing story and message of the Bible. Okay, so let's get to our review. We started this jog through looking at God's creation of everything over a six-day period, culminating in the special creation of man and woman on the sixth day. We dwelled on the fact that man and woman were made in the image of God, as his representatives in the world, and that this first couple was blessed by God and given a mandate to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Being created by God's purpose, in God's image, with God's mandate, gave something to the humans they could never have given themselves. Identity. God not only made all things with a purpose, but for humanity he revealed that purpose. Mankind was to rule over the creation. But we quickly saw the humans reject the identity that God gave them, and this happened in many facets. Rather than respect the created order as God had made, that order being God, then man, then woman, and then the creatures, We saw the serpent rule the woman who led the man who sinned against God. The authority structure was exactly reversed in a human denial of identity. Similar to rebelling against God's order, we saw a human rejection of God's purpose, that humanity should subdue the earth and the creatures in it. And instead, we saw Adam and Eve subdued by a creature. Finally, and critically, we saw the humans disobey God's one prohibition, eating fruit from the forbidden tree. In disobeying God's authoritative order, purpose, and prohibition, 
the first couple introduced an identity crisis to the essence of every one of their descendants. Would their descendants fulfill God's purpose and live in their God-given identity? Or would they reject God's authority and live according to their own desires? Well, soon we came to Cain and Abel. Abel sought to honor God by making a sacrifice of the best part of his flock. But Cain brings a regular part of his harvest. And God prefers Abel's offering to Cain's. Then, in a jealous rage against his brother, Cain kills Abel. Abel was killed for honoring God, and Cain proved that sin was an incredibly corrupting influence. God had told Cain to rule over sin, but Cain didn't withstand its influence. Yet despite Abel's death, God gave Adam and Eve another son in his place who was named Seth. They understood that the Messiah, the seed promised to the woman in Genesis 3.15, would come through Seth instead of their dead son, Abel. After this point, we saw death and sin and their pervasiveness among mankind, and we saw several generations later that mankind had become so corrupt that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. And when God saw this, he determined to judge the earth and only preserve the family of one man through this judgment, the family of Noah. And so God flooded the earth. And he saved Noah's family and the animals from destruction on a large wooden boat called an ark. Noah and his family become a new start for humanity. And God reiterates the same command to them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In that episode, we were also introduced to the idea of blood being the signifier in the Bible for life. And while we didn't get much into it at the time, this will be something important to remember as we move forward in the Bible. Generations after the flood, we saw that humanity continued to rebel against God and His rule. Despite God's rightful place as the creator and authority over all creation, a group of people decided to found a city and build a tower in defiance of God's command to fill the earth. Instead of receiving identity from God, they wanted to make a name for themselves. But God, knowing that this attempted unified utopia would be bad for the humans, differentiates the languages of the people, causing them to abandon their project and spread across the earth. Babylon and its tower were abandoned. But we'll see this city pop up again later as we read the Bible story. After Babylon, soon we meet a man from the city of Ur, one of the easternmost cities mentioned in the Bible so far. And God calls this man to go to a new land. God says to him, I will make your name great in contrast to what the people of Babylon tried to do for themselves. And over the next ten chapters, we see Abraham and the formation of the Abrahamic covenant. This covenant where God said, I will, I will, I will, and proceeded to make Abraham great promises that we summarize with three words, land, seed, and blessing. The land of Canaan, the many seed or offspring of Abraham, and the blessing to all the nations of the world that will be accomplished by one particular seed of Abraham. Then we saw Abraham trying to accomplish these promises for himself, as he tries to produce offspring with his wife's slave, Hagar. He assumed that Sarah, his wife, was too old to have children. And Hagar conceived a son named Ishmael. Yet God quickly said that no, it wouldn't be through Ishmael that he would accomplish his purpose but it would be through a child from his wife, Sarah. This reminded us of God's I will statements, where he would accomplish the promises, not Abraham. And God did what he said. When Sarah was about 90 years old and Abraham was about 100 years old, she gave birth to a son named Isaac. Then, years later, we saw the sobering event where God tested Abraham, asking him to sacrifice Isaac, the son of the promise. There, in the region of Moriah, we saw the boy Isaac climb the mountain with the wood on his back, who was soon bound by his father Abraham, ready to sacrifice his son as God had commanded. Yet God's angel stopped Abraham just before the death blow, and instead provided a ram as an offering to God. This event, perhaps more than any other, showed us the reason why Abraham is the example of faith in the Bible. 
He expressed his faith in God by total and utter obedience to everything that God had commanded. Years after this event, we met the twin sons of Isaac, Esau, the older son, and Jacob, the younger. God promised that the nations that would come from the sons would have this character, that the older will serve the younger. And we saw this begin to play out in their lives already. As Jacob, the younger son, gained his brother's birthright of a special inheritance and then gained his brother's blessing from their father. Jacob's life is largely characterized by this struggle for blessing, and he often used deceitful means to accomplish his goals. Yet we saw the incredible scene where he wrestles with and is ultimately blessed by God himself, who renames him. Jacob becomes Israel who in turn becomes the namesake for the nation that would come from him, the nation of Israel. Finally, we met Israel's twelve sons, and only focused on one son, Joseph. Remember, Joseph was the oldest son of Israel's favorite wife, and his brothers hated Joseph because he was their father's favorite, and they end up selling him into slavery. Well, God is involved too, and we soon find out that through the gift of dream interpretation from God, Joseph is elevated to second in command over all the territory of Egypt. In this powerful position, he helps prepare the nation for a severe famine that God revealed in a dream to Pharaoh. Later, in the midst of the famine, we saw the sons of Israel come to Egypt for grain, and Joseph uses this opportunity to create some distress for his brothers. But eventually, he reveals his identity and reflects on the event, saying to his brothers, You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. This took us to the end of the book of Genesis, the foundation for the rest of the Bible story. With that said, there's one more thing we need to do. So tomorrow we'll continue with one more bonus episode before we move on with the narrative. We'll be talking about the themes that go through the book of Genesis that will help us as we move forward in the story. Themes like mankind's identity crisis, sacrifices and blood, and the rule and dominion of God. Tomorrow's review will help tease out some wonderful tidbits that only grow in importance as we continue the story. Thanks for listening to The Bible Brief. Are you enjoying the podcast? One of the best ways for the show to grow is for you to share it with a friend. Will you do that today? We'd love to help more people understand the life-changing story and message of the Bible. Thank you for your support, and thank you for listening. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2022